Hi, I'm Shanu Modi from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center in New York City, and I want to welcome all of you to this educational activity focused on the latest treatment advances in metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer. And joining me today in this discussion is Dr. Sarah Tulaney from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, thanks so much, Shanu. I'm really excited for our discussion today. There's so much happening in HER2-positive disease. Uh, it's just an exciting time. Great. So why don't we jump in and get started? Uh, as many of you know, the HER2 story is one of the great successes of targeted therapy in oncology. And it started with the discovery of the ERB2 oncogene in the early 80s. And now today we have eight approved targeted agents for this subtype of breast cancer. Um, in fact, today we are in an era of dual HER2 blockade. And the culmination of all this work has led to a significant increase in the overall survival of patients with advanced stage disease now with a median survival of almost five years. So this is our current standard approach for the treatment of patients with advanced stage disease. And in the first line setting, the preferred regimen is a combination of ataxane plus trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And in the second line, the standard of care has been TDM1. And in the third line and beyond, we've had many options, all with very modest activity and so no one standard of care. And this past year, we saw the approval of four new exciting options for patients with pretreated disease, including two new uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, a new HER2 antibody drug conjugate, and a novel HER2 monoclonal antibody. So let's look at the data for these new HER2 targeted therapies in order to provide an approach on how to incorporate them into our clinical management of patients today. So Sarah, why don't you start us off by discussing the new tyrosine kinase inhibitors? Oh, thanks, Shanu. Um, you know, we've had tyrosine kinase inhibitors in breast cancer before, uh, where we've had lapatinib, which has certainly been our older standard. But I think one of the challenges with some of the older TKIs is that we do get off-target effects. It's not just really hitting HER2. For example, lapatinib also hits HER1 or EGFR. And by hitting EGFR, we're getting toxicities such as GI toxicity, as well as rash. And so what I think is quite novel is the fact that ticatinib was developed really to specifically target HER2 and really try to spare HER1 in order to really hit the target, have great efficacy, but have less toxicity. And we saw early data from a phase one trial that looked at the combination of ticatinib with capecitabine and trastuzumab that showed not just activity systemically, but also activity in the CNS. And this is really quite important because we know about 50% of our patients with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer will eventually get brain metastases. And so knowing that these tyrosine kinase inhibitors can get into the brain is really an important thing for our metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer patients. And so what was quite clever was that the HER2 CLIMB trial was developed, which really was a paradigm shift in the way that we develop clinical trials, because this was a registration trial that allowed not just patients who had systemic progression, but also patients who could have had progression in the brain. Uh, again, most of the times our prior registration studies had excluded patients with progressive brain metastases or untreated brain metastases. So this is really a very important study because I think particularly of its design. And so patients who had progressed on ataxane, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1 were randomized to get capecitabine with trastuzumab with or without ticatinib. And what we saw was that adding the ticatinib to the capecitabine and trastuzumab had a significant improvement in progression-free survival with a difference of around two months with a hazard ratio of 0.54. But even more importantly was that there was a survival benefit. Um, so this was in the all-comer population where we saw an improvement in overall survival from around 17 to 21 months. However, when we specifically look at outcomes for those patients in this trial who had what we called active brain metastases, so patients who had progressive metastases in the brain or patients who had untreated brain metastases, you can see that there was more than a doubling of response rate in the brain, and there was also improvement in progression-free and overall survival for these brain metastases patients. 
And this is quite striking because the overall survival difference in this subgroup was about 11 to 20 months, so very large difference in overall survival. And this is the first registration study to show survival benefit within a patient with brain metastases. So I think, again, a very practice-changing study. One question I think we've had is, is this not just improving survival for our brain metastases patients, but could it also be preventing new brain metastases? And so they did an exploratory analysis where they looked at time to onset of new brain metastases. This was in the all-comer population, so it included patients who could have had brain mets or not had brain mets, and they do see that there's a delay to time to new CNS events. I think, again, challenging to definitively conclude we are preventing new brain metastases because, again, this wasn't just patients who didn't have brain metastases at baseline. The study is not adequately powered to really look at this specific subgroup, but I think really um, hypothesis generating that this agent can potentially be preventing new CNS events. And so, again, I think this will be particularly important as this even translate, transitions into the early stage setting where this agent is also being looked at in the Compass RD study to see if it could even prevent brain mets. So I think an important thing to also consider is that this agent is pretty well tolerated. So if you look at the adverse events in this population, you know, the rate of discontinuation due to AEs is quite low. Uh, with about 6% of patients in the tecatinib arm discontinuing due to toxicity. And when you look at the specific adverse events, you know, I sort of think that it's kind of making the toxicities that we see with capecitabine a little bit worse. So, for example, we get diarrhea with capecitabine. It's a little bit worse when you add the tecatinib. We get hand-foot syndrome with capecitabine. Again, a little bit worse when you add the tecatinib. Um, but importantly, the diarrhea is predominantly grade 1 and grade 2 with a low rate of grade 3 diarrhea. And I think one other thing I've noticed clinically when using this drug is we do see bumps in transaminases periodically. So I've had patients whose you know, AST and ALT will bump up to like 150, 200, 250, and that is the tecatinib. And so you do need to keep an eye out for that. And sometimes I do need to hold drug and dose reduce when that does occur. So I think overall, you know, tecatinib is very well tolerated. It is leading to significant improvements in progression-free and overall survival and even benefits in patients with active brain metastases. So given these results, the FDA did approve this regimen, but interestingly, they made the decision to approve it in the second line and beyond, which I think is a little in intriguing because, again, remember this trial was predominantly conducted third line it was patients who had had prior taxane, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, TDM1, but now it has an approval second line. And I think this is probably for a couple of reasons. One, our sort of transition, that we've transitioned with the way we're giving a lot of HER2-directed therapies, where many of these agents are actually be, being given now in the early stage setting, right? So we use pertuzumab early stage, we're using TDM1 right. early stage, and so if you recur, you would have had these agents. So I, I really am very appreciative for the FDA to move this a little bit earlier because of that. And it also gives us the opportunity when patients develop brain mets a little bit earlier to have this available. So I think it, it's great that it has this approval. It is also being studied, though, in combination with TDM1 currently in the HER2 CLIMB 2 study. So that trial is looking at TDM1 plus or minus tecatinib. And again, they cleverly did a very similar design where they're allowing patients who could have active brain mets. So I think that will also be very important for us to understand um, if we could use tecatinib with a different backbone. So we also have another tyrosine kinase inhibitor though, which is neratinib. Um, so this is a little different than tecatinib because remember tecatinib was really specifically hitting HER2 and trying to spare the other HER family members. Whereas neratinib is what we call a pan-HER2 tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it's an irreversible inhibitor. So again, a slightly different mechanism of action, and I think, as you'll see, does have implications for its toxicity profile. So neratinib has been studied in combination with capecitabine. In the NALA trial, this trial was designed a little differently than HER2 climb, though. So the NALA study was for patients who had had at least two lines of HER2-directed therapy in the metastatic setting, but it, patients could not have active brain metastases. You could have treated brain mets, but you could not have active brain mets going into this trial. So again, a little different. Um, and again, they didn't mandate prior 
pertuzumab and TDM1 in the way that HER2 climb did. Uh, you just had to have had two HER2 directed therapies in the metastatic setting. So the patient populations are a little different. Um, and the control arm is here also different because the control here is capecitabine lapatinib. So they were comparing capecitabine neratinib to capecitabine lapatinib in this population and found that the neratinib combination did have a better progression-free survival than capecitabine lapatinib, but there was not an improvement in overall survival. So again, important to remember when, when thinking about this data. Interestingly though, again, even though this population did not have active brain mess, they did look at time to intervention for CNS metastases, really trying to see, you know, this drug we know gets into the CNS, and so by doing so, are we preventing time to needing to do radiation, for example, for a new CNS metastasis? And you can see that the neratinib arm did better in delaying time to CNS events, suggesting it's doing better at preventing CNS events than the capecitabine lapatinib combination. So while I think this is an active combination, I think one challenge we have had with neratinib has been toxicity with specifically GI toxicity because in the NALA study, even though everyone was required to take prophylactic loperamide, there was a 24% rate of grade three, four diarrhea. So not an insignificant uh, number of patients are having pretty high grade diarrhea. It's important to realize though that the diarrhea usually occurs pretty early. So the average time to onset is usually in the nine, 10 uh, day mark. And so you do know early on if it is uh, gonna occur. And I think since NALA has been conducted, we've actually learned a lot about how to potentially better prophylax against diarrhea. And so there was a trial called the control study, which looked at various combinations of uh, anti-diarrheal prophylaxis. One was a combination of budesonide with loperamide. Budesonide is an oral steroid that tends not to have a lot of systemic absorption. Uh, and this did better certainly than loperamide alone. We've also looked at cholestepol with loperamide, and cholestepol is a bile acid sequestrant, also does much better than loperamide alone. But I personally am a little biased and like the combination, or the, like the strategy of using dose escalation of neratinib and just PRN loperamide. And that to me has worked really, really well for our patients where we're you know, really getting good control of diarrhea and having fewer discontinuations of therapy. So um, again, that's personally what the strategy I've used when, when using neratinib therapy. So while I think capecitabine neratinib again was very active in NALA, there is work that's specifically being done to look at patients of active CNS disease. We had previously seen work with capecitabine neratinib with about a 50% 50, 50 uh, response in the CNS. And now there's a study ongoing looking at TDM1 and neratinib in patients with active brain met. So I think again, we're gonna see more uh, in this population from this agent. So this agent has been approved in the third line setting in combination with capecitabine um, for patients with metastatic HER2 positive disease. So offers another um, combination with a capecitabine backbone. I think the challenge here, however, is, you know, we also have ticatinib, which is an active TKI, which has less um, GI toxicity and does have a survival benefit, including in patients with active brain mets. And so I think most of us have been preferring to use ticatinib. And I think this makes a question of when would we use neratinib? We don't know if neratinib would work after ticatinib. And so, you know, more work I think is really needed to study um, how to best sequence uh, neratinib into the treatment paradigm. Thank you, Sarah. That was such an excellent and I think detailed overview. Um, maybe at this point we can switch to a case and see what, how we might potentially incorporate, I think, or apply some of these data in, into a real world case. So, so we, have, we have here then a, a case study of a 49-year-old woman who presents with back pain and a, and a large left breast mass. She's otherwise healthy. The core biopsy of the mouse shows invasive ductal carcinoma. It's ear pair negative, HER2 positive. And her PET scan unfortunately shows that there's already disease in the liver and in several vertebral lesions. And so she starts off with standard of care first line therapy, getting a THP, and has a good response, a partial response in her liver after three months. Uh, unfortunately, 18 months later, uh, there is more progression in the liver. And so she's now switched to our second line regimen, that's TDM1. Again, has a great response in the liver, stable bone mets, 
Um, but unfortunately, now, as happens with a lot of our patients with HER2-positive disease, she develops a headache and is diagnosed with multiple brain lesions, although with very minimal edema, uh, and, and simultaneously has systemic progression. So this is a case of a patient who has both systemic and CNS progression on, on her second-line therapy. And so, you know, given what you've just discussed about the, the TKIs, is this a patient you would start with uh, local therapy for her CNS lesions, or would you approach this case differently based on, for example, the data from HER2-CLIMB? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question because prior to HER2-CLIMB, generally my approach has always been to give local therapy to someone who has, you know, brain metastases. And then if their systemic disease was controlled, I would continue the same systemic agent they were on, whereas if they had systemic progression, then I'd switch it up. And so I think HER2-CLIMB brings in this question is, do we really need to do the local therapy? Because if someone has an asymptomatic brain met, they were included in HER2-CLIMB, and could we just use systemic therapy and avoid radiation and maybe save it for later when maybe we need it? Personally, if someone has small lesions, in this case, she was a little symptomatic, um, you know, she had a little bit of edema, a mild headache, I would probably do local therapy with SRS. But given that she also had systemic progression, I would want to change my systemic therapy. And again, knowing that the tacatinib combination has a survival benefit, um, including in patients with brain metastases, you know, I would choose capecitabine, tacatinib, and trastuzumab for her um, after the, the local SRS treatment. So, so you actually answered my what was going to be my second question of, of what systemic therapy would you recommend? So can I, can I ask you, just given the excellent, I think, data we've now all, all can acknowledge from the HER2-CLIMB regarding brain metastases, and as you even mentioned, maybe a potential to prevent brain metastases, um, although that's pretty exploratory right now, but do you think that the data from the HER2-CLIMB uh, should influence how we use you know, screening brain MRIs in our HER2-positive patients today? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question because, you know, really, as you know, our guidelines just tell us to screen when someone has symptoms, but not to do, you know, just routine screening MRIs. And, you know, I do think it calls into question this uh, because the rate of CNS metastases is so high in this patient population. Again, over time, you know, 50% of people have brain mets, and now we have an agent that can change survival for patients. And so it makes you wonder if you knew about the presence of the CNS um, metastases, you know, would you then use an agent that can improve their overall outcome? And in my mind, it also questions the fact is, if we know earlier, maybe we'll catch these lesions when they're smaller, and maybe we'll prevent our patients from having neurological symptoms, which really has an impact on patients' quality of life. And so there are actually several studies that are now being done to look at the you know, improvement that screening MRIs could yield in this population. And so for instance, one of my colleagues is running a trial where we're randomizing patients to do these screening MRIs or not. And we'll look actually to see if it prevents neurological symptoms as well as improves survival by doing them. But we need those data to know for sure uh, if we really should be screening. But you know, I'll say my threshold to get MRIs here is pretty low uh, because, again, you know, I, I do really want to know, um, you know, as soon as possible if someone has CNS involvement. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really great point. We're all kind of struggling and, and maybe picking and choosing those cases. I think I certainly have a lower threshold today given drugs like the availability of drugs like tecatinib uh, to, to screen some of my, my patients, um, but, but definitely an area that's still worthy of, a, uh, of uh, our community addressing, I think, formally. So, so let me take the, this case one step further. Let's say this patient has um, a great period of control with the tecatinib therapy, but then has further isolated CNS progression. Would you consider neratinib in a, in a case like this? So neratinib post tecatinib? So excellent question and one for which we have no data. Um, and so it's <laughs> challenging to answer. Um, you know, theoretically, one could think maybe neurotinib could work post tecatinib. It is different, right? It's an irreversible inhibitor. It's a pan HER2 inhibitor. Maybe it, it would work. Unfortunately, we don't have any data here to know if it does. And the other challenge is the backbone is also capecitabine, right, in NALA. Right. And while there's work being done with other backbones, such as with TDM1, again, this patient's also had TDM1, 
you know, what are you going to give it with? Would you give neuratinib alone? And we actually have data looking at neuratinib monotherapy in a tecatinib naive population, albeit with a pretty low CNS response rate, you know? So, yeah. um, and we also have data for tecatinib alone, that being said, um, with trastuzumab actually, also with a pretty low response rate in the CNS, um, you know, without the CAPE backbone. So, you know, I'll say, what would I do? I think I might think about other agents that I think we'll talk about soon, um, you know, as an alternative treatment rather than going to neuratinib here, just because we don't have very much data and because we don't have another backbone to give it with, um, you know, outside of capecitabine, which this patient would have just progressed on. Um, but I think we do need data here. And again, there are trials being discussed um, to try and look at this question of TKI, post-TKI to, to help us understand its benefit. Right. Well, thank you, Sarah. I think that was such an excellent discussion, and, and thank you for putting a lot of those um, issues into perspective for us. You know, maybe I'm going to move on now and, and talk about, as you were alluding to, uh, another exciting uh, drug uh, in this space uh, of newly approved therapies. And so, so this past year, we also saw the approval of the new uh, of a new HER2 antibody drug conjugate called trastuzumab deruxtecan, or what we call TDXD for short. And it's the next generation ADC, so it, I think it has some advanced pharmaceutical properties which give it a therapeutic advantage, for example, over TDM1. So starting with the linker, this is a cleavable linker by enzymes that are selectively upregulated in tumor cells. Uh, and so the ADC is actually very stable in non-tumor compartments, including the blood, and it releases the drug just where it's needed. Secondly, the chemo payload, I mean, it's a really potent topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, which is almost 10 times more potent than arena TCAN, for example. And there are twice as many chemo molecules linked to each one of these HER2 monoclonal antibodies, which is twice what we see with TDM1. So it really delivers a lot of this chemotherapy to, to the cancer cells themselves. Additionally, the chemo itself is not a kind of chemo we typically use in our breast cancer patients, so the tumor cells haven't previously developed a resistance to this mode of cytotoxicity. And most importantly, the chemo is membrane permeable, so it can pass through the cell, main of the HER2, uh, cell membrane of the HER2-positive cells and then kill neighboring cells as well, which may not even be uh, HER2-positive. And, and this, is, uh, this allows TDXD, I think, to have a very broad uh, activity or a range of activity. Uh, and it's, it's, it's uh, called, and this is what we call the bystander effect. And I think in testament of these really superior therapeutic properties, TDXD has shown exciting anti-tumor activity in phase one studies. So not only in HER2 positive breast cancer, uh, but in a wide range of tumors and also a wide range of HER2 expressing tumors, but also in HER2 low breast cancer. And we're gonna be talking about this specific group a little bit later on. So all of this work really led to the registrational phase two trial we call Destiny Breast 01. Uh, and this was a study for patients with confirmed HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Uh, 184 patients were enrolled on this trial and treated at the recommended phase two dose of TDXT. And this, this was a pretty heavily pretreated group of patients. As you can see, they had a median of six lines of prior therapy. All the patients had prior uh, trastuzumab and TDM1. Two-thirds also had pertuzumab, and about half had a prior TKI. So the vast majority had really received all of our best HER2-targeted therapies already before enrolling on the study. And the primary endpoint of the trial was to look at the uh, objective overall response rate, and this was confirmed by independent review. And so here is now, I think, the infamous waterfall plot, which is, I think, very dramatically and very clearly shows just how powerful and active this new ADC is. Uh, with a confirmed response rate of 61%. And if you look at the far left of the, of the waterfall, you can see that there were virtually no patients uh, that did not respond to this therapy in some way. So I think we feel, I, I always feel very confident when I put someone on this therapy that they're gonna get some benefit. I think even more impressive is the durability of the benefit. The median duration of response was 20 months. Uh, and so responding patients can stay on this therapy for a very long time, and it's really unusual to see such activity in, in a late-line setting. So, so really impressive data. Here are the PFS curves. Overall, the median PFS was 19 months. Again, unprecedented for a late-line setting. Uh, the interim median overall survival was recently presented, and it is 25 months. This is an interim data point. We hope to have more mature data uh, for this trial later this year, potentially even at ESMO, and, and the expectation is that this number is going to increase. 
In terms of safety, I think overall what I describe as the day-to-day -day toxicity profile of TDXT, I mean, it really did show good tolerability, general tolerability. The main common or the most common side effects were GI in nature, nausea predominantly, and bone marrow suppression. And most of these, thankfully, were, were grade one and grade two in nature, and they were manageable with supportive therapies. Of course, lung toxicity is an important special toxicity of TDXD that, that's become, um, I think, well described. And it ranges all the way from asymptomatic grade one findings that are radiographically picked up, uh, all the way up to some, some ra rare and, and uh, cases of fatal ILD. In, in the breast destiny one trial, the overall rate of uh, lung toxicity was 15%. Uh, thankfully, again, most of the patients had grade one and grade two events. One of the important things to point out is that the median time to onset of any lung toxicity is approximately six to seven months. And there does seem to be a plateau with most cases happening within the first year of therapy. So there does not appear to be a cumulative risk uh, with TDXD treatment. So there has been, I think, a very massive and extensive effort to, to talk about this risk and educate both physicians and patients, I think, to be vigilant for it. And there have been a number of updated guidelines on how to, I think, manage this risk, including having a very low threshold to hold the drug in cases of any suspicion of lung toxicity and including, uh, you know, and involving, I guess, the, your, your, a multidisciplinary team, which includes your radiologist and your pulmonologist, and the key is to start steroids early. And in some cases, I think it's important to point out that for, for patients who do have symptomatic uh, evidence of lung toxicity, what we would call grade two or higher, uh, those are the patients where you would consider, uh, where you would you know, rec currently uh, hold further treatment or permanently discontinue TDXD therapy. I think the early indications are that these efforts have been pretty successful in curbing the rates of high-grade lung toxicity, uh, and, but I think we do need to obviously await more mature results and, and data from some of the ongoing phase three trials to confirm this. In fact, the two phase three studies, Destiny Breast 02 and Destiny Breast 03, both are now completed, and we hope to hear some results potentially from Destiny, the Destiny 3 trial which is a head-to-head -head comparison of TDXD versus TDM1 um, by the end of this year. So I think coming back to our algorithm, you know, for the more pre-treated third-line setting and beyond, um, but also for those patients, I think, who need an urgent response or have uh, a need for a significant reduction, rapid reduction in disease burden, I think I would give preference to using TDXD therapy, and, and really that's based on just the remarkable efficacy we've seen from the Destiny Breast 01 trial. Uh, and the fact that it also has the advantage of working in this uh, hereto heterogeneously uh, expressing cancer, and again, we'll talk about that a little more, uh, which may be you know, a mechanism, a relevant mechanism in refractory patients. So um, maybe at this point, we'll, we'll go back to our case study. Uh, and Sarah, I'll let you, let you take that away. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Sanu, for such an excellent overview of TDXD. Um, I think maybe to put that into perspective, we can twist our case a little bit. So if it's the same patient who had first-line THP and then progressed and went on to TDM1. In this case, the patient did not develop brain metastases but rather went on to develop an increase in her liver enzymes and was found to have progressive liver metastases. She did end up getting a brain MRI and had no evidence of brain metastases. And so now again, the case is a little different because this is someone who is third line um, but does not have brain mets. How would that shift your thinking here and how would you decide on the optimal you know, third line approach. Uh, would it be TDXD? Would it be tecatinib? How, how would you think about that? Yeah, I mean, so so this was actually the exact kind of patient that we enrolled on the Destiny Breast 01 trial. And, and I think, you know, given, again, the great efficacy data we just saw, you know, I would be uh, in favor of treating a patient like this, uh, particularly someone who has worsening liver disease, uh, with, with a drug like TDXD for the third line, for the third line setting. And you know, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier with, when, when we talked about the TKIs, that I think the, the, the case where I would really put, I think, tecatinib therapy, 
ahead of TDXD would be in a patient who had active brain metastases that didn't need urgent radiation uh, and, and for whom you would want to attempt to defer, defer radiation therapy. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, outside of that setting and, 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 and especially for patients who have, I think, very high burden of visceral disease that's growing and you feel you may have a small window uh, to, to get the disease under control, I would probably reach for TDXD in that, in that specific case. I think um, putting, putting those two scenarios aside, and, and, and I think the, the majority of our patients probably are in the category of they just have slow, you know, systemic progression with, with stable CNS disease. Um, so I think at that point, you know, I would say we have two really great options and, and it becomes, I think, a, a discussion between the physician and the patient and, and I think really incorporating the, the toxicities of the two therapies and, and the patient's preference, I think, really all become paramount in, in making the best decision for, for that person. I think they're both really great drugs. We get asked a lot, you know, about the sequencing of these two. Um, and, and it's really interesting to point out. I mean, I do think at some point people will probably sequence through both. Um, and, and, and I was just going to say it's probably, it's, it's interesting to know that there is actually an ongoing trial where both drugs are also being combined uh, in a phase two setting. And so maybe in the future, we won't actually have to choose between the two. We'll be giving them together potentially. Yeah, no, it is. It's great that there, there is this study with TDXD and Ticatinib, um, which right. will allow patients with brain mets, which will be uh, really nice as well. Uh, but I, I certainly very much agree with you in this particular case, you know, with someone with visceral progression, uh, I also would, would turn to, to TDXD. You know, this patient did have a brain MRI despite being asymptomatic. Um, and, you know, maybe that influences our decision a little bit here, knowing she didn't have brain mets. Would you have done that MRI? Um, and how are you thinking about using it, um, you know, in an asymptomatic patient? Yeah. I mean, look, I think you articulated it pretty nicely in, our, in the last discussion. Our, our current guidelines don't really incorporate screening asymptomatic patients. But I mean, those were also generated in an era when we did not have drugs like tucatinib and neratinib. Uh, so so I, I think it, it's probably time to revisit um, sort of how we think about this space, especially given, given drugs like tucatinib. Uh, so I think, uh, although I, know, I think it's difficult to probably make a generalization here, um, in patients where I am seeing a high burden of disease and, and progression in this second, third line space, I am starting to do, I think, brain MRIs more frequently uh, in select patients uh, and, and with the view that, look, we, we have the potential to use that as a, as a differentiating point between these two excellent um, new therapies. Uh, and, and, you know, my hope is that, you know, like you said, I, I hope that we, by, by finding maybe these asymptomatic uh, brain metastases, if, if, even if we, we may not change the overall trajectory, and I, I don't think we know that for a fact, but even if we don't change the overall trajectory of the disease, I hope we are at least um, preventing morbidity for patients and improving quality of life. So yeah, my short answer is, I might have actually done a screening brain MRI on, on, in this case as well. Uh, oh, that's interesting. I, uh, so, you know, sort of continuing on with that theme, do you think TDXD has activity in the brain and what data do we actually have for TDXD in patients with brain metastases at this point and, and what data are we hoping to collect here? Yeah, I mean, so the, the db one study actually did enroll patients who had treated and stable brain meds, so not like the HER2 CLIMB trial. Uh, and that was about 13% of the, the study population. It's a small number, it was a total of 24 patients uh, in that category. And, and we know typically HER2 positive patients who have brain meds tend to have a worse overall prognosis but the group of patients on TDXD with stable brain meds who were treated um, actually had the same, if not slightly better, clinical outcomes as the whole study population. Um, they had the same duration response response rate and, and median progression free survival. Additionally, in the trial, when they looked at the sites of progression, only 8% of patients had progression in the CNS, and that was equal, equally divided between those with baseline brain meds and those without brain meds. So, uh, I think there was a hint of, uh, there is a hint of, of activity for TDXD in the CNS. Right now, there is an ongoing uh, registry trial being, being led by Dana-Farber, of course, Nancy Lynn, 
at Dana-Farber where we're collecting the experience of, of uh, what happens in the CNS for patients who are getting standard of care TDXD therapy. And we've actually submitted um, one or two cases uh, for, th for that project as well. And anecdotally, I think we are seeing some responses. There are studies, I think, ongoing right now directly testing that question. So I think we need to stay tuned for more data, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to see uh, some, some, some positive results there based on the signals we have already. Yeah, no, I, I think it's true. Um, I'm also very optimistic that, that this agent, at least in a patient who has um, brain meds up front, uh, does you know, seem like it's promising that it, it will have activity. So definitely more to come. Um, right. So sort of continuing on that, I think we've continued to see multiple agents get approved here in the HER2 space. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about margituximab and, and right. this right. agent. Yeah, so, so this was the fourth and most recently approved new HER2 targeted agent, as you called it, margituximab. And it's, it is a HER2 monoclonal antibody. It's much like trastuzumab, but the FC domain has been modified or engineered to have a greater binding affinity for the activating CD16A receptor on immune cells. And that's shown here in, in the picture. So the monoclonal antibody binds HER2 on the tumor cells and the FC, FC domain binds to those activating CD16A receptors on on the immune cells. So the margituximab has the potential to induce a much more vigorous immune response against the tumor. Now genetically, the majority of the population, about 85% of us, have a low binding CD16A receptor genotype by virtue of having an F allele, so we're either FF or VF. And this is the group of patients we would actually expect to have a greater benefit from a drug like margituximab than trastuzumab. And so the SOFIA trial was a phase three study for patients who had at least two lines of prior anti-HER2 therapies. Uh, and patients um, were then randomized to receive either standard of care chemotherapy plus trastuzumab or the same standard of care chemotherapy plus margituximab. And you can see here that <clears throat> almost all the patients on this study did receive prior trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1. So this is a, like a conventionally treated you know, third line beyond population. Uh, in fact, uh, the study did have two primary endpoints, sequential endpoints, uh, PFS and OS, and an exploratory endpoint uh, looking at the efficacy of margituximab in relation to the CD16A receptor genotype. And as shown here in the primary endpoint PFS curves, there was a 24% decrease in the risk of progression in the margituximab arm compared to the trastuzumab group and that's with a hazard ratio of 0 0.76, uh, which translates to a very, very modest 0 0.9 month absolute improvement in PFS. And uh, this is still a statistically positive result. So a positive study, and this was the basis for the FDA approval, although I think admittedly um, a, a modest absolute benefit. The interim overall survival uh, data so far have shown no significant difference between the two arms, but more mature data are, are expected. I think for me what was interesting was the exploratory analysis where they looked at the efficacy of margituximab based on genotype for the CD16A receptor, and they did show a more pronounced benefit for margituximab in the F allele carrying patients as had been predicted for both PFS and, and OS endpoints. So potentially, I think this could be a biomarker for patient selection. Uh, with regards to the adverse events, I mean, both groups had a very similar safety profile. There were slightly more infusion reactions on the margituximab arm, but these were really grade one and grade two in nature and, and pretty easily manageable. So. You know, coming back to our algorithm one final time, I think based on its pretty modest efficacy, but, but really excellent tolerability, I do think it's fair to consider a trial of margituximab-based therapy for the very refractory patient who you're considering, you know, using, reverting to sort of standard of care, trastuzumab-based based options of, you know, typically trastuzumab plus chemotherapy. So overall, I would place margituximab in a lower priority amongst, I think, these new HER2 targeted agents for, for those reasons. So, so one category of patients we actually haven't touched upon yet are those patients who have a hormone receptor positive, ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer, 
And you know, this is a subgroup that has the potential to be treated sort of differently than, than, than the rest of the population. What is your approach in, in treating this, this subgroup of, of HER2 positive patients? Yeah, no, it's a really important point because I think sometimes we forget about it. Um, right. You know, right. that we sort of come on this pathway that we've talked about, you know, THP, TDM1, you know, maybe tocatinib or TDXD. We just have this algorithm in our head. And it's really important to remember that half of our patients actually have ER positive, HER2 positive disease. Um, so it is important to realize that endocrine therapy could play a role for some of these patients. You know, there's some thought that maybe the HER2 positive patients may have some resistance to endocrine therapy due to this crosstalk between ER and HER2. And so maybe blocking both pathways may actually be really important when you know thinking about endocrine therapy for our HER2 positive patients. The challenge is that the initial data that looked at blocking both HER2 and ER, uh, so combining endocrine therapy with HER2-directed therapy, really wasn't that impressive. So there's pretty modest benefit. You know, we saw for the, from the TANDEM trial about a two-month improvement in PFS by adding trastuzumab to anastrozole. We saw larger benefits when looking at adding a TKI, um, specifically lapatinib, to letrozole. Um, but again, you know, I think we were hoping to do a little better. And so there has been work looking at adding dual HER2-directed therapy to endocrine therapy. Mm -hmm. We saw this in the PERTAIN trial, which looked at an AI plus trastuzumab plus or minus pertuzumab. The trial was a little complicated because it did allow for induction chemotherapy to be given prior to the enrollment um, with the endocrine therapy. Um, but in general, the study did find that adding pertuzumab you know, to the AI and trastuzumab did result in improvement in progression-free survival. And I think this has supported our utilization of dual HER2-directed therapy with endocrine therapy. And so my general approach here is if I have someone who I'm starting on, for example, the THP first line, you know, Cleopatra regimen, oftentimes after six or eight cycles of taxane, we often think about dropping the taxane if they've achieved a really good response or if they've started to develop some you know, toxicities. And so then they're on this HP maintenance phase, if you will. And so in that place, in my mind, is a really nice place to introduce the endocrine therapy as your maintenance um, agent. So I usually will add, for example, an aromatase inhibitor um, to that, you know, trastuzumab, pertuzumab maintenance at that point, because I think it's a really nice way to integrate the endocrine treatment. But I think one question has also remained is, is there a role for CDK4-6 inhibition in our ER positive, HER2 positive patients, just because we know these agents have added such impressive benefits to our ER positive, HER2 negative patients, it makes you wonder if we could see these benefits in the HER2 positive population as well. And you know, we have some early cell line data that had suggested that these agents don't just work in the luminal cancers, but also work in the HER2 positive cancers. And some of the very early data that was done with the bemacyclib in the phase one study had allowed patients who had HER2 positive tumors to enroll. And this was just to a study of a bemacyclib monotherapy in heavily pretreated patients. And yet amongst the, you know, this is a small group of patients, but amongst the hormone receptor HER2 positive patients that enrolled onto the phase one with the bema alone, the response rate was 36%. And this was, again, heavily pretreated patients. So it made you think, well, maybe this drug can work uh, in our HER2 positive uh, patients. And so um, the Monarch HER study had been conducted to really help answer this question. It's a little bit of a complicated design because it took patients who had progressed on at least two lines of HER2-directed therapy for their metastatic disease, but then it randomized them to one of three arms so they could get endocrine therapy, specifically fulvestrant, with a bemacyclib and trastuzumab, or they could get a bemacyclib with trastuzumab, so no endocrine therapy in that arm, or to get chemo a physician's choice with trastuzumab. And so the question really was, you know, is an abemacyclib containing regimen better than chemotherapy a physician's choice with trastuzumab? And so what the study found was that the triplet arm, the fulvestre and abemacyclib trastuzumab arm, arm, did do better than chemotherapy with trastuzumab with a difference of around 2.6 months in terms of PFS. But the abemacyclib 
without endocrine therapy and trastuzumab arm did pretty much the same as chemotherapy and trastuzumab. So it means that even without endocrine therapy, it's performing just as well as chemotherapy. But once you add the endocrine agent, you know, it's probably adding synergistic activity to make it perform even better um, than the chemotherapy. I think the challenge here was there was no fulvestrant trastuzumab arm to really suggest that you were outperforming endocrine therapy. Uh, but the fact that the abemacyclib arm performed just as well as chemo really makes me think that the CDK4-6 inhibition really does work here. And so there are a lot more studies that are ongoing in this space. Um, so we had seen some early data looking at palbocyclib with trastuzumab, and there was a signal that this combination seemed to have benefit specifically within the luminal subtype of HER2-positive disease. So the, the trial that's being done, the Patricia-2 study, is looking at endocrine therapy with palbociclib and trastuzumab and comparing it to physician's choice therapy. Um, so again, similar to, to the moniker uh, idea, and so we'll get more data there. Um, and then the PATINA study actually just completed enrollment, and this study was looking at that sort of maintenance phase that we were talking about. So after your induction chemo with dual her directed therapy in that first line setting, when you drop your chemo, and you go on to your endocrine therapy and trastuzumab, pertuzumab, this study said, let's randomize you to also add on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, specifically palbociclib, and see if that will improve outcomes. And so it's really exciting that that trial just completed accrual, so we'll have to wait a little bit uh, to get some results, but I think could help us understand the role for CDK4-6 inhibition, at least in this more first-line uh, population. And then there's actually an adjuvant trial um, that is just starting, uh, the you know, eMonarcher study, which will look at abemacyclib in the extended adjuvant setting um, after completion of HER2-directed therapy. So I think, again, a lot more to, to come with CDK4-6 inhibition for this population. So I think just to put into perspective, I would say don't forget about utilizing endocrine therapy in your ER-positive, HER2-positive patients. To me, the most natural place to put it in is in that maintenance setting after the first line um, chemo induction phase. But I think importantly, even later on, um, to integrate endocrine therapy with HER2-directed therapy is important to think about. Um, so don't forget about it, particularly if your patient isn't having you know, rapid visceral progression or something. And um, that's a point when I think you may wanna think about you know, fulvestrant trastuzumab, I will say personally, every once in a while, I do use CDK4-6 inhibition uh, with endocrine therapy and trastuzumab and something you can think about again in the later line setting, but just important not to forget integrating it because it does work. And I think we do sometimes uh, forget about it because we have all these uh, HER2-directed therapies to, to uh, think about in our algorithm. Yeah, I mean, there's so much going on in this space and, and, and maybe, you know, as, to follow along that line, you know, where, where, may, where, where may we be headed still? So I think as we look to the future, um, another exciting and emerging, I think, clinical uh, application of HER2 therapy is the role of HER2 agents beyond HER2 positive uh, disease. And, you know, there is a new generation of HER2 targeted therapies that are so potent and active via unique mechanisms that they have the potential to be effective for what we are now ca now calling HER2 low expressing cancers, which we define as tumors that have IHC1 plus expression or 2 plus and are fission unamplified, what we would have traditionally called HER2 negative disease and for which our current HER2 therapies are, are ineffective. And this is actually, or this actually represents a significant proportion of our breast cancer population. And, and I think it, this is actually going to force us to reconsider our current dichotomous classification of HER2 as either positive or negative. I think the best example of this uh, of, of this is the is the new HER2 antibody drug conjugate trastuzumab direct to can, which as we discussed earlier has got this very potent cytotoxic payload that can you know ha pass through the cell membrane and induce a bystander effect. So can uh, have an have an impact on sort of uh, cells that have lower HER2 expression, and we are seeing a broad range of activity for TDXD in, in a variety of HER2 expressing tumors. And very importantly, we saw significant activity for this drug in HER2 low expressing breast cancers. And this is the waterfall plot from a phase one of TDXD in patients who are heavily pretreated HER2 low breast cancer. And I mean, the response rate is far greater than what we would have achieved with standard therapy in this setting. 
And, and not only that, when we look at the spider plot, that benefit was far more durable as well. So I think this is pretty exciting um, data uh, for, for this HER2 therapy in a traditionally defined HER2 negative breast cancer population. And based on the strength really of that phase one data, uh, there was a randomized phase three trial, the Destiny Breast 04, uh, which is a study for patients with HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. And this uh, uh, is actually a trial that's fully enrolled now and it randomized patients to either TDXD or standard of care chemo. Uh, and it's possible we may hear some early results from this trial later this year. There is another HER2 antibody drug conjugate, SYD985, or trastuzumab duocarmazine is its other name, and it has a DNA alkylating agent at its, as its payload, and that agent can also induce a bystander effect, and they too have shown some really promising results in HER2 positive and HER2 low uh, expressing breast cancer, as is shown here in a phase one study. So again, some very exciting potential to expand HER2 therapies to a whole new group of patients in the future. One other, I think, promising area of expansion is the use of HER2-targeted therapies for HER2-mutated cancers. And HER2 mutations actually exist in a broad range of cancers, of course, as shown here on the right, and often at low rates and, and in a variety of sites. For example, in traditional HER2-negative uh, hormone-positive breast cancer, we see rates of HER2 mutations ranging from 5 to 10 percent, and these can occur at various sites on that RBB2 gene. Um, so the Summit Basket trial enrolled patients with a variety of, of tumors with HER2 mutations and treated them with neratinib therapy. Remember our PAN-HER family kinase inhibitor. Um, this is a waterfall plot for the metastatic breast cancer cohort. I think it shows a promising and durable response for HER2-targeted therapy in these HER2-negative, ER-positive metastatic breast cancer patients with with HER2 mutations. So again, we're starting to see an expanding role for some of our HER2 therapies beyond the traditional HER2 positive breast cancer patient. And there is obviously a lot of still exciting uh, new drug development on the horizon with new uh, anti-HER2 therapies and, and of course co uh, novel combinations. Uh, and this, this slide by no means is, is complete. Um, and with that, I think Glimpse into the Future will conclude this presentation. Uh, um, I want to uh, summarize, you know, by 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 reminding you that that you know we are in an era where we have some very new, exciting uh, HER2 targeted therapies, and and I think the best way to incorporate them uh, that that we have today is to use uh, the, our clinical guidance uh, from the trials and 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 what patients benefited most from from these therapies. Uh, most importantly, I think. Um, the decision between using tecatinib and TDXD seems to, I think, largely be based on the uh, uh, the acti you know the priority of treating active brain metastases, where we've seen really great results with tecatinib. Uh, and, and on the other hand, for patients who have, I think, really predominant visceral disease that 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 needs urgent treatment, you know, we're seeing such tremendous efficacy for TDXD that might be an appropriate way to differentiate those two. I think really exciting agents. And, and our other, other, other agents probably uh, are also important uh, for specific patient populations, neurotinib perhaps for the patient with ongoing CNS involvement, and margituximab, given its excellent safety profile, may be an appropriate therapy to use at some point in that patient who's doing well and still needs you know, late-line therapy. Um, so, so with that, listen, I, I really want to uh, end the educational activity and, and start by thanking again, Sarah, for, for such a fantastic discussion and for sharing, us, sharing with us all of your, your incredible insights in this field. Um, to our audience, we hope you found the activity interesting, informative, and useful for your practice. And we want to thank you all very much for participating. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.